Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today we're going to take Gross Path Challenge number 54. I'm sheltering in place here in Bethesda, Maryland, so it looks like a good time to put another test together. Are you ready? Well, let's begin. Here's slide number one, and this is tissue from a nude mouse. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? Well, time's up. I hope that you pause the recording in order to give yourself some time for that. We're looking at the liver. The liver is very moth-eaten. There are multifocal areas of necrosis, uh, incorporating probably about 75% of the liver. So this would be a multifocal necrotizing hepatitis or multifocal coalescing hepatic necrosis. Either of those would be fine. Probably the best answer for this question is what was considered the scourge of new mice colonies when they were first introduced. And this is polytropic mouse coronavirus or mouse hepatitis virus. The histologic lesion is widespread necrosis. And in these areas of necrosis, you can see multinucleate viral syncytia. Big cells are often necrotic themselves, which gives the diagnosis away. Polytropic mouse coronavirus will give you syncytial cells in a number of organs, including the liver and the intestine. I saw that when I was first a resident uh, back about 30 years ago, but haven't seen it in a long time. It's been cleaned up and certainly uh, cleaned up in these nude mouse colonies. There are a couple of other possibilities for necrosis in the liver of a mouse, especially a nude mouse. Uh, one that I would think of would be Tizer's disease, Clostridioides piliformi, which will cause widespread necrosis. You could probably come up with a couple of more, including Ectromelia virus, a very rare condition, something you don't want to see in your colonies, and maybe uh, a remote possibility would be a very hot gram negative like Salmonella uh, in mice. But when you think about nude mice, I would put mouse hepatitis virus at the top of your list for hepatic necrosis. Okay, slide number two is tissue from a cat. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis? Okay, time's up. We're looking at a somewhat alopecic. It's a fixed mass from the skin of a cat. We've lost the hair here and it's been bisected and we see that within the dermis, elevating the epidermis, there is a darkly pigmented multifocally cystic mass. And for those of you who immediately jumped onto melanoma, unfortunately, you're probably going to be incorrect. Obviously, the pigment distracted you, but the most common neoplasm of cat skin is a cystic and pigmented basal cell tumor. Some people call them trichoblastomas. They have been referred to in some texts as apocrine ductular adenomas. But uh, the characteristic here are large areas of cystic necrosis as well as pigmented basal epithelium. So cystic and pigmented uh, basal cell tumors are the number one most common tumor of cat skin. If you call it a trichoblastoma, I think you would be okay as long as you mention cystic and pigmented. Okay, slide number three is tissue from a chicken. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? Okay, time's up. Hey, this is one where the, uh, the identifier and ruler was put right beside the lesion. And what, I, what we're looking at are the sciatic nerves of this bird, and I want you to compare them in terms of size. This one on the right side of the picture is larger. It has sort of a duller appearance and a nice normal white control on the left. The morphologic diagnosis is diffuse sciatic nerve lymphoma. If you wanted to go uh, sciatic lymphocytic neuritis, I will take that as well. I just find that in this particular disease, Marek's disease, that lymphoma seems to be less to right and works just as well for just about any lesion. 
This is considered one of the classic lesions that is associated with Marek's disease. You have infiltration of uh, multiple nerves, including sciatic nerves, with neoplastic lymphocytes. And it causes uh, dysfunction of the nerve, and the animal drags its back legs, giving rise to the classic hurdler syndrome, where the animal is pulling itself along with one leg, with the other leg sort of dragging along behind it. It's one of the less common uh, manifestations of Marek's disease. You can also see uh, uh, irritable lymphoma, a number of other things. It's actually probably more classic to see it, obviously, in the viscera. Uh, the liver, the spleen, the follicles, the feather follicles, but it's a classic lesion that everyone should know. Sciatic nerve lymphoma. Slide number four is tissue from a horse. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? Okay, time's up. We are looking at the aortic valve and in a supravalvular location, a classic spot for this particular condition, there is granulomatous aortitis. If you said granulomatous arteritis, that would be fine too. If you look really close, you know what you're looking for, you're going to see these large larval strongyles coming up here out of this granuloma. The morphologic diagnosis is a focally extensive, proliferative, and granulomatous uh, aortitis with larval strongyles. Uh, this is a not uncommon lesion associated with strongylus vulgaris. Normally they form the very typical granulomas and proliferative lesions uh, with a pseudoaneurysm or, or a outpouching of the wall in the cranial mesenteric artery. And they're pretty good about ending up there as fourth and fifth stage larva before they migrate into the colon where they live as adults. Uh, but occasionally they make a wrong turn. So you can see them here at the base of the aorta. They seem to get stuck above the tricuspid valves, and they don't progress. So there's a great leash, uh, spot for that. You can also see them in the renal arteries, uh, rarely in the uh, pudendal or the splenic arteries or other arteries of the caudal abdomen. Um, they are red, especially the adults. They are hematophagous or they, uh, they ingest blood, which gives them a red color. Okay, granulomas and proliferative aortitis with larval nematodes. Slide number five is tissue from a dog. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis, a cause, and maybe two other lesions in this animal? Okay, time's up. Hey, we have another big red worm. Hey, this worm is red not because it's eating blood, uh, but it is a spirurid. Spirurids are, are big uh, nematodes and they have a brightly eosinophilic fluid which is in their, uh, uh, it's in their pseudocelome or it <clears throat> inside these animals. So, so spirurids of all types tend to be bright red for a different reason than the strongyles are bright red. This is not a blood vessel, okay? Very thick, has a wrinkled, you remember that the esophagus is always going to be sort of whitish on the inside. It has a very thick squamous layer because you are pushing uh, partially chewed food, especially in a dog or cat. Um, esophagus can distend, especially in dogs, about five times its normal size because they bolt their food, and cats actually do too. So this is an esophagus. Don't mistake this for a large blood vessel. There aren't any openings. Uh, for the nutrient arteries here, and this is what you expect, and you have a very thick muscular wall. Okay, but what we're talking about here is another granuloma. Morphologic diagnosis would be uh, a suffocal esophageal granuloma with spirurid adult, and this is an adult, not a larval form, and spirocircolupi 
is the uh, spirula that we are talking about in the dog is just generally transmitted by dung beetles or other beetles like cockroaches. And uh, when the beetle is ingested and digested, then the larva will, the larva will uh, pass through the wall of the intestine and will migrate in the adventitia of the blood vessels, including the aorta, and it will move up to the esophagus. Um, remember, the esophagus and the aorta and the thorax are very close to each other. It will burrow into the wall of the esophagus and mature, um, and the adult worms will live in mucosal granulomas. The female actually will protrude from time to time. Her hind end from the granuloma pass eggs into the uh, ingesta, and they will eventually pass out and that's how the uh, uh, the life cycle of this parasite is continued. Oh, I've got a fight going on over here. Well, it's a play fight uh, with Smeegs and the kitten. But she's not very happy about that. Okay, so that's what happens when you uh, record these at home. Okay, so I also asked you for some other possible lesions and most of those have to do with aberrant migration by these parasites. Just like Strongyles, they've got a pretty good GPS and they usually end up where they're supposed to. Sometimes they end up in the wall of the aorta and they will cause granulomas there. And you can actually see granulomas in multiple organs throughout the body when one goes wandering and ends up in the wrong spot. Um, something else that will, you will often see because of their, uh, their predilection to migrate along the adventitia of the aorta in the uh, in the thorax is you can see uh, irritation at, to the periosteum of the ventral side of the thoracic vertebra and so you end up with a vertebral spondylosis proliferation of a woven bone along the bottom side of those uh, vertebra and so you can see spondylosis of the thoracic vertebra so those are all pretty good lesions. And another one that uh, you don't see very often, it's pretty uncommon, but sometimes these granulomas as a result of probably chronic inflammation, irritation and all that, may undergo malignant transformation into sarcoma. So you get, get sarcomas in the esophagus and the aorta as well. And that's a really bad uh, thing to happen with these particular parasites. So you can see a lot of lesions, you can see them in a lot of places, and uh, it's a great, great gross picture. Okay, slide number six is tissue from a horse. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis? Okay, time's up. Well, this is, this is a great picture. Um, and when you look at this for a moment, you're thinking, I got no idea what I'm looking at. You know, you got some hair here and there's some sort of cyst and, and almost looks like a chicken foot up here and maybe there's some pus and it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, one of the classic things when you see things that are around or regularly around from horses and you can't get a good idea is I always think, could this be an ovary? Because some really uh, interesting lesions happen in, in ovary that have faced the ovaries and, and you end up sort of with a blob. And this is exactly what we have here. This is an equine ovary. And it's tough to figure out what this is until you realize, hey, this shouldn't have hair inside the body, especially in the ovary. Uh, the body doesn't like hair. It tends to form a pretty uh, severe suppurative reaction against it. So, so that's why most of the keratin on our body, if not all, is outside our hair, our fingernails, everything on the in outside, because keratin is not something the body likes. And I can't think of any organs that are normal on the inside of your body that have hair. So whenever I see that, I'm immediately thinking about a teratoma, a neoplasm, which is composed of cells from the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. They're derived from, from uh, germ cells which have undergone their first, but not their second, uh, postmeiotic division. And we do see these in a number of species. Uh, so hair on the inside is a bad thing, probably gonna be a teratoma. What this cyst is, I'm not exactly sure. 
it could be a large cyst uh, because we're looking at hair and skin. It could be something that is lined by uh, endodermal elements like a GI or respiratory epithelium. And this sort of yucky pus may be a body's response to hair. So great picture, teratoma in a horse. Okay, we got four more left. And this is tissue from a cat. Can you give me two morphologic diagnoses? Okay, time's up on this one. And there are two morphologic diagnoses on here. They're both incidental findings, and they don't really mean anything in terms of pathogenesis, but you need to be able to recognize incidental findings and tell the difference between those and pathologic findings. And the first one that I want to bring your attention to is here in the liver, and you have these areas of redness or blood. If you're able to take a better look, you can see, and maybe you can get an idea because of this highlight, is that they are slightly depressed. And these are areas of telangiectasia or telangiectasis. Telangiectasis. And this, these are areas where we have lost little pockets of hepatocytes. Um, they've disappeared. The areas have filled in with blood. This is an incidental finding that you'll see in cats on a fairly regular basis, especially older cats. It doesn't mean anything. You also see this in cattle as well. It's nice if there's a little bit of fat in the liver because they show up a lot nicer. And there is a little, little fat here. So they show up very nicely. Cats and cattle, telangiectasia doesn't mean anything. We also see it in humans and rats because some of the early pathologists who read out rat liver tissue or human pathologists, they gave it the same name as it is in people, and it's called peliosis hepatis. So there's a little disconnect between the domestic animal literature and the laboratory animal literature, but it's the same lesion. What caused these hepatocytes to die and go away? I can't tell you. We just don't know. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a nice lesion. And if we're talking about lipidosis, I didn't ask you for this one, but you can see the liver's a little bit sort of orangish, but see these little white foci, those are little areas of, of fat in the liver too. Let us know there's a little bit of lipid. But the other morphologic diagnosis I want you to come up with was multifocal pancreatic nodular hyperplasia, another common aging change in cats. And you can see all these little nodules. This is a normal liver. Or pancreas in between, and these little nodules. And if you looked at them under the microscope, they would be nodules that are, that are expanding and compressing the intervening pancreas, but they look very much alike. They have a little bit of, of color change because some of them have too many zymogen granules, some of them have uh, not enough zymogen granules, so they may be more red or more blue, but really this is an aging change and doesn't mean anything. It's not a neoplasm. Sometimes you'll see islet cell tumors in the cat. They tend to be red as opposed to the normal pancreatic tissue because they're heavily vascularized. I don't see that there, but I see a lot of these nodules of exocrine pancreas hyperplasia. Slide number eight is tissue from a fold. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis? Okay, this is one you probably had to look at for a little bit, unless you've seen this before. And this is a pretty uncommon uh, lesion in foals as opposed to other species, such as cats and hamsters. And what we're looking at, I'll go back to it, just gave you a preview of the next question, but let's focus on this one. We're looking at the right kidney of a foal. It's laying on its side. The right kidney usually looks a little bit like a, a Valentine's Day heart, okay? But you lay it on the side and, and uh, you know, where the two parts of the heart come together, that's where the ureter is. And here's the ureter right here. And we see these multiple cysts. And this is a polycystic kidney in a foal. Look how big this cyst is. You can see very little cortex here, and this is all capsule. Now the capsule is, of the kidney is pretty tough stuff. I've seen some really big cysts in various species. I'm always amazed that they don't rupture, but they usually don't. 
unless there's a, you know, a lot of compressive trauma as well, because that capsule's pretty tough. But uh, this is polycystic kidney in a foal. As I said before, uh, it's not common. There are very few reports of this. We had a great case last year, 2018, 2019, in the uh, Wednesday slide conference, it was Dr. Cianciolo's conference. She comes, she's a renal expert from uh, Ohio State University. She's very excited about this because she doesn't see it much in, uh, in horses. So polycystic kidney in a foal, and usually most of these cases, the animals don't do very well. They're of the recessive form where um, most of the kidney at birth is taken up by cysts, how they form, whether they come out of glomeruli or tubules, nobody really knows, but uh, uh, this usually is not associated with a long life or a good outcome. Polycystic kidney in a foal. Slide number nine is tissue from an ox. How about a morphologic diagnosis, a cause, and name another organ that may have a similar lesion. Okay, time's up for this one. This one's a little tricky. I don't think it's too tricky. It's more just prioritizing your diagnoses. But what I see when I look at this section of intestine, probably ileum, is I see that the mucosa has these very intense folds, almost a cerebriform folding. Then we have this area right here, which probably represents a lymphoid tissue or a Peyer's patch. Same process going on there, but it's outlined very nicely. Okay, whenever I see this cerebriform folding, the first thing I'm going to think about is paratuberculosis or Yoni's disease. The morphologic diagnosis for this is a diffuse granulomatous. I'll take enteritis, I'll take ileitis, I would even take colitis. Okay, um, now some people will say it's not really granulomas, you don't see multinucleated cells. And if you said histiocytic, I will take that too. Because uh, I'm relaxing here, it's Sunday afternoon and I'm gonna be benevolent, I'll take a lot of stuff. But for me to take any of that, you've gotta know that this is Yoni's disease. Now what makes this one a little trickier for me are two things. One, the nodularity, okay, but I can't, you know, ignore the cerebriform appearance to the gut. And the other thing that we have that you generally don't see is we see these areas of congestion. They're linear areas of congestion. And you can see this in the gut, especially the colon of uh, animals who have had chronic diarrhea. And in some diseases, it was called, referred to as tiger striping. And tiger striping used to be a classic lesion of the colon in cattle with rinderpest. But it really is nonspecific, it's not classic for anything. Um, what happens is this gut, because there is no form feces, these animals have projectile diarrhea, and it's constantly uh, contracting and trying to, uh, to push something along. Um, but there's no form feces and it ends up contracting and you get areas of severe congestion um, where the normal folds would be in the colon or the intestine. So that is sort of a nonspecific finding, just telling me that this animal probably has had chronic diarrhea for a long time. So I hope you got this one. It's a classic, just a couple of little things. The nodularity, I'm not exactly sure. This one's more nodular, but all of these nodules and the diffuse really have trouble with with uh, keeping this straight. Um, all of these uh, nodules are aggregates of histiocytes in the lamina propria. So it's still Yoni's disease, and I'm sure probably everyone uh, got this one right. Okay, we have one more slide, and it's tissue from a cat. And my cats have settled down over here. I got Smeeks, and, and I've got the new one, I got Finn who are, are looking at each other, but they have settled down, they're gonna take a nap in the sunshine. And we have one more kitty cat right here, and we're the morphologic, I would like a morphologic diagnosis and name the condition. 
Okay, time's up. Here's a classic presentation of the eosinophilic granuloma complex in a cat. Now the eosinophilic granuloma complex is a multitude of lesions, three very classic lesions, including indolent ulcers of the oral cavity, eosinophilic granulomas, which could pop up anywhere on the body. And then we have one that classically will show up, not always, but classically shows up on the backside of the back leg. And you get these areas. These are known, and the, the, the condition is known as a linear plaque. Um, this is one that you may or may not, depending on the chronicity of the lesion, see a lot of eosinophils. And that's the same thing with the indolent and rot rodent ulcers in the mouth. If it's been around for a long time, um, you may have mostly lymphocytes and plasma cells. And of course, if it's ulcerated neutrophils, very few eosinophils. The eosinophilic granulomas, they tend to be raised, very weepy and angry looking, and they always have lots of eosinophils and macrophages, but the linear plaques may not. It may simply resemble histologically a chronic lesion. The morphologic diagnosis I would like would be, uh, let's go with a multifocal ulcerative and eosinophilic. You got to get it in there, even though we might be seeing one at the sort of the tail end, um, but a ulcerative and eosinophilic dermatitis. Name the condition, linear plaque, and just realize it is a well-characterized and described facet of the eosinophilic granuloma complex in cats. And that brings us to the end of Gross Path Challenge number 54. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope that uh, all of you are uh, indoors, or if you are considered an essential worker, uh, make sure that you take every precaution for socially distancing yourself, getting your, uh, getting your work done, and then getting home so we can flatten the curve on this terrible disease. Uh, I will see you all tomorrow with another Gross Path Challenge, and I hope uh, as best you can, you have a great day.